So since our last episode, we've uh, moved the boat up here to St. Anne in Martinique. Uh, we're going to be getting ready here for some big crossings that we've got coming up in the near future. Slightly different episode this time. Uh, instead of the normal sailing and vlogs, we're going to be running through um, the offshore setup that we have on this boat and and how we've set the boat up for blue water sailing. We've also supplemented this episode with an ebook that is available on our website and you can find the link below. Uh, but we will give you some more info about this at the end of the episode. Over the last few months and episodes, we've been receiving quite a lot of questions uh, relating to the blue water suitability for this boat, a Beneteau Oceanus 40, and, and how a modern production boat like this performs uh, when you're offshore. We were pretty inexperienced when we first bought this boat. We hadn't done much sailing at all. So we obviously had the same question. And uh, yeah, we put it out there on the sailing forums uh, to be pretty quickly told unanimously that... Uh, you must not take <laughs> this vessel offshore. <laughs> so obviously it is quite a debated subject in the sailing community. And we are not entirely sure on our position on the matter due to our lack of experience, but we are really interested in hearing all different theories about the subject so feel free to leave a comment below on on um, your view of the subject we will be very happy to to hear it all from our research blue water boats they seem to be categorized into a few different sections uh, basically the hull shape uh, keel and rudder configuration the displacement uh, the rig design and of course the price so this boat, an Oceanus 40, based on them categories, is probably not designed specifically for offshore sailing. Um, it's still possible, but if you should use like the right tool for the right job, I guess there is boats out there that are specifically designed uh, for heavy duty offshore cruising in mind. In saying all that, um, on our planned route, which is a trade wind circumnavigation, extreme heavy weather is kind of rarely experienced. Um, if you're sailing in the right season, of course, and the right weather windows. Um, and so far on this boat, we've lived aboard now for about three and a half years. And we've sailed about 10,000 miles, uh, starting from Norway. Uh, we headed south through Europe and across the Atlantic to the Caribbean. So in this episode, um, we'll do our best to sort of run through um, the boat's layout, um, some of our experiences and to run through some of the changes that we've made to sort of set this boat up as a, uh, as a blue water boat. Um, the easiest way to kind of do that is to separate everything into various sections starting of course with the most important rigging and sails. An Oceanus 40 is a fractional rigged sloop with a mast height of 18 metres, length of 12 metres, draft of 1.9 metres and a dry displacement of 8.3 tonne. Originally the boat was fitted with a 40 square meter mainsail and a 39 square meter genoa. Our rig modifications include a complete standing rig replacement, installation of a furling inner forestay and Dyneema removable running backs to provide additional mast support and more sail options in both strong conditions to reduce sail area and also provide more sail options in light conditions. So to help explain some of these upgrades and modifications we've done on board, we'll uh, have a little walk outside and uh, show you each item. So uh, this has been our most important upgrade uh, so far to the rigging, is uh, installing this uh, inner force day. Um, it's a Selden uh, furling system. Um, it's connected here to a chain plate down below, uh, that was already on the boat and it's secured in the bulkhead here between the anchor locker and the Ford V-berth. And up top we've uh, installed it just above the top spreaders with the running backs there and that keeps it parallel with the, uh, with the main force day. So this is where our running backs uh, come back to. We've just got a uh, 10 mil Dyneema uh, through a low friction ring. We double it through the friction ring and down here to a, just a Selden pad eye. We run it through this block here and this works perfect to get it back to the, the winch, the aft winch here. Pretty much just leave it tightened all the time uh, because we've got the furler up the front. So we lock in the running backs to keep the tension and as long as we're on second reef, the mainsail sits underneath, uh, underneath the running backs, which is perfect, we can jibe all day long. Uh, we have a, just a Selden backstay tensioner here but original on the Beneteau, it came with two very small U-bolts uh, for the backstays. We didn't like it. 
very, very small and skinny. So we, we drilled out a whole new set of chain plates, uh, upsized them quite a lot because we thought there'd be a lot of force going downwind. And we'll show you the big uh, backing plates we put underneath. So the backing plates that we installed are just here. I think it's a 10 mil or eight mil aluminium plate. Uh, we drilled through eight and 10 mil bolts, one for the backstay, one for the running backs. And it just adds a lot more strength there than the original little uh, U-bolts. Uh, so we also installed this in Norway. It's uh, just a Selden uh, spinnaker pole and the track that goes with it. Uh, we decided to get two um, two spinnaker track cars and this one here has just got like the traditional kind of uh, ring fitting. I don't even know what it's called. And this one's the toggle for the Selden one. So we also run this old uh, spinnaker pole here. Uh, so basically we can set up the twin poles out each side and uh, run the two head sails together. Uh, yeah, goose winged, dead downwind. And this works pretty much perfect for that. We've installed lots and lots of these low friction rings all over the boat just to redirect the sheets to our winches for the spinnaker and the jib. Uh, so we changed these around a little bit. We got sick of the metal on metal banging and we just added some Luma ball bearing blocks here with Dyneema webbing and just like, uh, I think we split them open a little bit to spread the load and to take away that banging noise when you're jibing all the time. And it turned out really good. It's reduced the load for us. We've got the traditional uh, reefing method with just these uh, hook and ring at the front of the sail. Um, we do use the reefing lines for one, two and three, but we run them to the winches. Um, so we just reef the, the back of the sail and we manually have to come up to the front and just, just hook the ring onto the, uh, onto the hook there. So with regards to the sails, we have both the Genoa and our mainsail are cross-cut Dacron sails that are original. Uh, with the boat, so they're both about 10 years old. They're quite basic and very stretched, uh, but we've had the UV protection serviced and we've also had another reef installed in the main. So we are pretty much just trying to get as many miles as we possibly can out of them. Uh, we also have a small stay sail that we use quite a lot. It is a lot newer than the main and the Genoa, so it is in quite a nice condition. And it's about 17 square meters and it's definitely our favorite sail. We also have quite a large 100 square meter spinnaker. Uh, it's a symmetrical spinnaker and it's pretty good. It goes well in light conditions and calm seas and uh, it has definitely saved us a lot of miles. We've installed a lot of extra clutches here in the cockpit uh, to improve the sail handling at sea when it's just the two of us. So we've got a couple of new ones that we've put in here. We've uh, moved all the furling lines so they lead straight into the cockpit instead of being out on the tow rail as it used to be. And on this side, you can see we have all the reef lines leading back to the cockpit. And we also have the pole, uh, the downhole for the pole, as well as the preventers for the boom. So it's pretty easy that we have it all in here and don't have to go out on deck. Next up, we'll cover navigation and all the steering systems we have on board. So we've made quite a lot of changes and upgrades in order to just make it safer and easier while we're offshore. Uh, but the biggest job we've done is to make this uh, instrument box under the spray hood here. So it's made out of ply and epoxy and we've relocated a lot of the main instruments like the chart plotter, our wind instrument and just this little like a speed data. It's been great, especially in the cold weather where you can stay in here and you can control everything like the autopilot and all the other instruments while you're protected from the elements instead of having to go back by the wheels. So this is definitely the upgrade we are most happy about when it comes to navigation. So the traditional chart plotter used to be here on a swivel. Uh, it was absolutely terrible in winter when you're sitting back here and kneeling down and touching the screen, freezing your ass off. So we got rid of that pretty quick and we've put this very ghetto box and riveted in place instead. The charts we have on board are from iSailor, that we have an app we have on the iPad. And this is what we use mostly for navigating offshore and also to do all the passage planning. Uh, but we also have two chart plotters on board, one down here and one up in the instrument box. 
So we use them to monitor the AIS, to see all the traffic that's around us, but we also use them to look at the radar, to have the wind data, and uh, to look at the depth on the sounder, so they have quite a few functions. So if you haven't already seen the video, we did install a uh, hydrovane before our big crossings. We do have an autopilot and it works fine, but uh, just as a redundant backup um, to save a bit of power too, we've installed this. Uh, it does most of the steering uh, as long as we're offshore. We don't use it so much between the islands, but uh, for the big passages, it saves so much power. So yeah, autopilot for the small trips and hydrovane for the big trips. Harry. Harry. He gets insulted. You have to call him by his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So our autopilot is connected just here behind. We've got the control arm here, the rudder stock coming up with the quadrant, and it's just a traditional Raymarine autopilot, the hydraulic ram, and an electric motor over there. I can climb in the back and show you that part. Got the motor here and the Raymarine ram just there. In the uh, Ford cabin here, just underneath the mast, uh, we before we left Norway, we installed a uh, like a bronze fitting uh, for uh, depth. Uh, it's actually a fish finder from Raymarine, just to give a bit more data on the screen than just a traditional depth number. And here we just have like the normal paddle wheel speed sensor that seems to always block up. Uh, so to run through our power system. Uh, we have 410 watt solar panels and about 400 watts of wind, a silent wind wind generator. We have uh, two panels on the rails, just there, and we've got two panels on the top of a targa. Pretty small panels, but we have this little system we can tilt the angle to follow the sun to get the most out of it during the day. Um, I'll show you that now. So two of the panels are just here on the rail. It's not ideal, it's a bit of a homemade system with some bin me rails but they're very easy to tilt. You just rotate them in the morning, get the morning sun, and they're on these little mounts here from Noah. Really good, you just tighten and loosen them like that and rotate the panel around. So we couldn't really afford to, or we didn't have the time to install a proper solar arch, so we've got this little uh, slat made from bin me rails and a mount and it just bolts onto our rails and it just holds two additional panels on the top. Uh, you can also rotate the panels up here, just like that. And we pretty much do that in the morning and we get sun from 7 a.m. It's, it's brilliant. So the silent wind is here on our port side. Uh, we have it installed on a scan strut mount but it's on the break at the moment, so it's just sitting there. Obviously, we've got too much charge, but if you want to see it, we have a separate video of installing that when we were still in France. On this side, on another pole, we have a Raymarine radar. Uh, one of the modern ones, it doesn't really use much power, but it's great for monitoring squalls. This is just in the starboard aft locker. Uh, this is where our silent wind charge controller is. Uh, it's wired into the battery locker and we have the solar panels here on a twin pole uh, isolator. All the panels are just done in parallel. Uh, wired through here on this breaker and then uh, obviously forward into the batteries where we've got a charge controller there. So the battery locker is down under one of the main berths in here. So we have uh, four six volt uh, AGM or AGM lead carbon batteries. Uh, they're 230 uh, amp hours each one. So when you're series in parallel in total, we have yeah, 460 amp hours, which is pretty small. But this space in here is very small and that's all we could work with. And I think we kind of got a lot in for the space that we had. Also in the battery locker, we've just got our isolator, just to give uh, charge from the alternator. We've got the shunt there for the monitor, the Victron controller, our shore power charger, and we also have the autopilot in there, just with a very small inverter. It's only uh, 300, 300 watts, but it does the job just for charging our laptops and whatnot. So we've been quite happy with our panels and the and the charging system. Uh, on a like good sunny day in the Caribbean, 
Usually we're getting about, you know, maximum 20 to 25 amps, but usually from 9 a.m. you're getting above 10, and yeah, the batteries come up to voltage pretty quick. I'll show you on the monitor what we're looking at. Well, we just monitor it here on our little monitor. Um, yeah, so what are we now? It's about lunchtime. Um, yeah, we've got 10 amps coming in and we're already up at 14 volts and 100%. Uh, we just try and do our, all our charging on this plug during the day, daylight hours. You can also monitor the panels via the uh, charge controller here on the Victron app on the iPad. Uh, you can see down here that it's in the absorption phase there and you can see the current going in and the voltage going in and you can kind of track through the previous days. So such like yesterday we were on bulk for seven hours, absorption for three and you know each depending on how much sun you get. Some days it's on float for you know five or six hours of the day which is really good. So you can also track like the total you were getting in like uh, three days ago uh, we had good power and we were, what do we get? Uh, what 1.7 kilowatt hours uh, for the day uh, maximum 17 volts and it says here that the lowest the batteries got in the 24 hour period was 12.7 which is really good considering the fridge is running uh, almost continuously in this heat and it's usually about seven seven amps uh, so another topic that's uh, quite discussed I guess when it comes to blue water cruising is uh, storage and tankage and these kind of boats are not really known to have great storage or tankage. So, but I'll show you what we got on board. Um, up here, we have a big water tank under the bed. We got 160 liters in that one. And we got another 200 liters of water under the bed in that cabin. And in this cabin, we have 200 liters of diesel under there. And we also have perfect surfboard storage in here. We've managed to get four boards in and uh, there's still sometimes room here for one more berth. And we also carry an additional 100 litres of water in jerry cans up on deck. And we got about 80 litres of fuel in jerry cans on deck. Uh, but we usually also buy like the big 5 litre bottles from the supermarket. And they fit perfectly under the floorboards here. We can fit 20. 20 so we, bottles, so that brings it up that to, to another 100 litres. 100 litres, yeah. So yeah. In, in case of an emergency, if the, the water tank breaks or we have any issues with the pump, then we have like that as an like, emergency backup water. So we have a total of 560 or 560 litres of water that we can carry. And um, yeah, we don't have a water maker, but that should be enough for the two of us. Yeah, for two on board with your consumption, 560 is quite a lot. That can often, when we're yeah. cruising, in the Caribbean that can last us what, two, like months, two, two yeah. months if we're very cautious on the water. And that's with showering and dishes and, and you know laundry and all that too. So we do have a salt water pump here which helps a lot for the water consumption. So we, do, we just do the dishes and salt water and then we've just filled this little spray bottle up with the fresh water. So after cleaning it in salt we just rinse it with some fresh water and just keeps the keeps the consumption down. It's really it really in. slow to wash the dishes like that. Yeah Sam hated the idea when we started it. <laughs> it takes ages but you know. It does need... save a lot of water. We're not in a rush we have plenty of time. So when it comes to food storage we keep most of it under the couches and the seats. So we've got this one is propped up with food. We got all our cans under the couch here. Wait I can just show you quickly. Hey, it's very full. <laughs> That's prepped for the Pacific That's for crossing. The Pacific. And yeah, we got some just under the seat here at the chart table. And then also under the floorboards here, we've filled up with food. Yeah, so here's, well, there's not much food at the moment. Just it's full of beer <laughs> and under the collar is all wine. This is what, what I call the wine cellar. <laughs> Keeps it nice and cool. Fridge, standard Beneteau. Got little freezer. And it's absolutely it's, full again. Yeah, it's just been thrown in there so you can't find anything. Also when it comes to the subject of the Blue Water Cruiser, I would much more prefer to have a little L-shaped galley. This, just having it on the side can get a bit hectic sometimes if we're on the, if we're on the wrong tack or the wrong lean. So out here we have the gas locker. 
and we have a European bottle there, we got the American bottle and we got these shitty little camping gas bullets and we also use this as just the tool tools locker and uh, yeah a lot of bits and pieces and over on this side so it's a tiny bit smaller than the gas locker but we keep all our rigging spares in here we have our emergency tiller and we also keep some of the power tools in there so we have our main storage lockers at the back here we got one big one here and another big one down there so this is where we keep all like the most of the deck hardware we keep all the fenders we have down here all our snorkeling gear and uh, lots of ropes etc and so down here we keep our spinnaker so she stays nice and dry easy to pull it up when we need it and we also keep a lot of ropes down here So with regard to safety, uh, we've installed quite a lot of things uh, on board uh, just in case of an emergency when we're offshore. Um, firstly, this is our grab bag. Um, it's a waterproof bag here that you fold and seal at the top. Uh, we always keep it topped up for a passage uh, full of flares, a first aid kit. We've got some water in there, some valuables and documents. And uh, we always keep it somewhere, usually just here at the chart table, accessible. Um, so we can easily run down and grab it um, yeah if anything was to go wrong the boat was pretty empty when we first got it um, so specifically for offshore we did uh, install quite a lot of like emergency equipment or communications equipment that we could use for an emergency uh, including this EPIRB here um, it's a GPS EPIRB we've mounted it here near the companionway a uh, rechargeable just a handheld VHF um, we have just a fixed VHF here that's got like a distress DSC button and of course we've also got the uh, Iridium Go um, that we just tether to our iPad and all of our iPhones so yeah obviously we can make calls and send emails and messages for additional info in an emergency situation. So obviously one of the most basic, most important pieces of emergency and safety equipment is the life jacket. So we got this saver once and then we also use lanyards that we we always stay clipped in when we're in the cockpit especially when it's just the two of us and especially at night time when you're on watch by yourself so we usually just clip it on to the life jacket and then stay either clipped on by the companion way or by the helm uh, so the safety stuff out in the cockpit we've got this uh, like a man overboard sling uh, it's got 50 meters of floating rope on it with a big float so for anything man overboard would obviously just be throwing that in the water we've also got this uh, inflatable Dan boy uh, yeah we haven't used it before but it's the same deal it has a little grab bag here with weights and a float and a light and you just throw it in the water it uh, self inflates and obviously leaves a big marking Dan boy wherever anyone's fallen over so we need to mount that to the rail when we do a crossing and the life raft we have here is mounted to the transom. It's just a four person uh, Servitec ISO life raft. Um, yeah, we've got it in a cradle here. The way we've got it set up, we use a knife to deploy it and it's fixed to the boat. So the last subject we're gonna run through is uh, the anchoring equipment that we have on board. Uh, pretty important for a blue water boat, especially when you're going to be sort of spending long periods in the Caribbean and the Pacific when you're anchoring out. There wasn't a great deal of equipment on the boat when we bought it. Um, there was about 30 meters of chain. So we upgraded everything and we got 60 meters of 10 mil chain uh, with a 20 meter rope extension and we got a 20 kilo Manson Supreme as our primary anchor. We have a stern or a kedge anchor here. It is a uh, 10 kilo delta. Uh, we've got a roller here on each side and we've got a bag with 50 meters of uh, weighted rope. So here's the anchor locker. We got heaps of chain in there. We got the quick windlass, 1000 watt and so far so good, we haven't had really any problems with it. We're anchored in about 5 metres now and we've got 30 metres of chain out. 
we usually try to go up and drop it in a sandy spot and we never really drag. We've got two kind of bow rollers, a big and a small. We run the chain through the port side and the snubber we run here uh, to our bow cleats and through the smaller starboard roller. Uh, our snubber's set up here just on a big uh, dildo, I don't know what you call it, stretchy thing. You can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was good. Um, yeah, we just hook a little bit of Dyneema through the chain there. It stops like the metal on metal rubbing and really stretchy uh, 16 mil poly with the yeah stretchy sausage dildo thing. We recently just got this uh, installed on the bow roller. It's just an extra support to attach to the hull underneath. You can see the support coming down there and bolted through. And this will also be for the spinnaker attachment for the spinnaker when we go downwind so we can fly it like an asymmetrical. So that pretty much covers all the topics that we wanted to discuss. Uh, all in all, we're pretty satisfied with the boat. Um, it's taken us quite a long distance so far and at the same time it's uh, really like allowed us to learn a lot about sailing uh, along the way. As we mentioned earlier, we have put together a little ebook with a bit more in-depth information that covers a lot of the questions we get regularly about the boat, the upgrades, the costs and things we've learned along the way. It is available for downloads on our website sailingbeaver.com. We've also recently started a little Patreon page as a way of sharing more of this type of content for the future. So if you like our videos and what we do, you can contribute for each video we put up and that would be very much appreciated. All the links should be provided below in the description. Our plan from here is to spend a bit of time between Martinique and Guadeloupe as we prepare to sail 4,000 miles across the Pacific, which we are very excited about, but also quite nervous. So thank you all for watching and for staying with us. We truly appreciate it and take care and we'll see you next time.